Okay, so in this video, we're going to take a look at, uh, first of all, the symbols we use to draw circuit diagrams. We're going to take a look at current, and then we're going to finish off by looking at what makes some components series or parallel. Uh, so let's make a start, because uh, we're going to be using these circuit symbols all the time as part of this topic. So. First, the first four you can see here are all different sources of power sources, sometimes referred to as EMF sources. So a cell you'll see looks a little bit like this. Sometimes you'll see it without the plus and minus signs, but uh, even if it ha doesn't have the symbols on, the largest side is the positive side. A battery, uh, which is very commonly used in circuitry, is essentially more than one cell acting in series together like this. A power supply or a power pack, uh, the circuit symbol looks like this. This time you do really need to label the plus and the minus sign so you know which one's which. And an AC looks the same, but you can see it has the wavy line. We can't label a plus or minus side because they're constantly switching. Uh, speaking of switching, a switch in a circuit, you get something that looks like this. So this is showing an open switch or a switch that doesn't allow current. And we also use a lot of these in, in circuitry, they're called resistors, or in, to be more specific, fixed resistors. Okay, so just to take a look at what some of these look like, so you can actually find them when you want to use them. Uh, so a cell you should, and battery pack you should be fairly familiar with. Power packs you'll be using quite a lot. There are a few different variations that all look a bit different, but most power packs allow you to have both DC or AC outputs because uh, they have the components inside them called a rectifier that allows it to output DC as well as AC. A switch looks something like this. Sometimes it's got some more fancy stuff around it, but essentially it's a big button that you can press. And a resistor looks like this, but again, sometimes these are incorporated into a bigger device because these are easily lost. The colors on the resistor indicate what its resistance value is. Okay, and moving on to finish off the circuit symbols we're going to look at today. So a variable resistor is very much like a resistor, but with an arrow through it to show that it's variable. A thermistor or a temperature sensitive resistor looks like this. So uh, this device's resistance will change uh, with temperature if, if the surroundings. A light dependent resistor will change its re resistance depending on the light intensity on the LDR. So it looks like this. So again, a resistor, but with arrows coming in, uh, showing that it absorbs light. A uh, filament bulb, a uh, very common component we use, looks like this. An ammeter, a circle with an A in it, and a voltmeter, a circle with a V in it. And that concludes these circuit symbols we're gonna look at. So again, just to take a quick look at what these look like for real. So for variable resistors, we usually use a device called a rheostat, which looks like this. And you can slide the bar up and down to allow the resistance to change. A thermistor is usually on the end of two long wires, and that allows you to dunk it in liquids, which is the very e is the easiest way to change its temperature by putting it in different temperature liquids. An LDR looks something like this. So the top is what you point towards the light source, and though what you can see there is designed to absorb light waves. Filament bulb, again, is a bulb, and you can see the filament there in the middle. Uh, ammeters and voltmeters come in many different forms, so I've kind of tried to show you both there. So these are both digital type uh, ammeters or voltmeters. So you can see the one on the left is an ammeter because we've put the black thing that we call a shunt has been stuck into it. We can also turn those orange ones into voltmeters if we put the voltmeter shunt in. Or the other kind we come across quite a lot are multimeters like you can see here, which again you can turn into voltmeters or ammeters depending on what you're trying to do. And multimeters you can actually also turn into ohmmeters or devices to measure resistance. Okay, so that's our components. Let's, so let's move on to current. So what is current? Well, it's the rate of flow of charge. So in a circuit, our power source is causing charge to move around our circuit. And I'll explore in later videos why that happens. And current is the rate at which the charge flows. So when we say the word rate, we mean per second. So current is the number of charges per second that pass through a certain point in our circuit. 
so current, uh, we give the symbol I, and if you're intrigued as to why it's an I, uh, go onto the internet and have a look. Uh, it will explain where that comes from. And we measure it in a unit called ampere, which we usually short to shorten to amps. Uh, but that's named after a famous physicist in the world of electricity. And that's given a capital A when we're writing it. So if we want to use an ammeter, which is what we use to measure current, we would need to connect our ammeter in series with the component. And we'll talk about precisely what series means later on. So in an ideal world, if we're using something as an ammeter, it should have zero resistance because we don't want the act of measuring the circuit to have an effect on the current. So ideally, our ammeter would have zero resistance. In the real world, they just have very, very small resistance. Okay, so there are, even amongst ammeters, there are kind of two types, and it's the same with most measuring devices. We can have either analog measuring devices or digital ones, and they each have different applications. Uh, so one is not better than the other. So analog is a device that can measure continuously within its range of measurement. So you can see on the left, this ammeter can measure anywhere between zero and one amp but there's nothing requiring it to take fixed positions. It could occupy any position between those two. Whereas our digital ammeter can only take values um, with, to the nearest second decimal place or the nearest hundredth. So the digital ammeter forces the value to be certain numbers. You can't have anything between those two. So that's kind of the difference between those two. But like I said, one is not better than the other. They each have different applications. Okay, so something you have to watch out for something that crops up more often with analog uh, type measuring instruments but can occur with both is something called a zero error and that's when a measuring instrument has a non-zero reading when it should be reading zero so you come up to the measuring device it's not plugged into anything but it's not reading zero so there are kind of two ways of dealing with this and i'll show you the different t times we'd use both so the first thing we could do is if we can, we would re-zero it. So um, something like a mass balance, for instance, there's usually a button on it, which allows you to re-zero and set what you've current the current conditions to zero. So that's an option. Or if we can't do that, the other thing we can do is just subtract that value from all the readings, because that should be the same for all your readings. So if we subtract it, that should give us what the true measurement is. So uh, some examples of where you'll come across this. Uh, so later on, when we're investigating how cross-sectional area of a wire affects its resistance, we'll be using a micrometer. And micrometers very commonly have a zero error on them. So the one on the left at the bottom, you can see has no zero error because it's reading exactly zero. Uh, the one in the middle is currently reading two, even though it should be reading zero. So that's got a zero error. And the one on the far right is currently reading minus four, again, even though it should be reading zero. So we get slightly different variations, but those are both zero type errors. One you'll be a bit more familiar with already will be a mass balance. Uh, so very frequently you'll go up to a mass balance and it have a reading because it depends on what the previous person used as zero. But mass balances come with a nice button on them that says zero. So it's something you need to make sure you do before you use it. Okay, so final section, looking at series and parallel components. Now you've probably come across this idea before, but I want to be precise about what we mean by series and parallel, and then I'll show you an example which people commonly get wrong. So, series are two components that have the same charges passing through them, and more specifically, the if the charge goes through one, it must go through the other one. So if we look at that, so if we look at the two that I've labelled A and B here, so any charge that goes through A must go through B. So we describe those two as being in series. Whereas the description of parallel, we've got two components that don't have any of the same charges passing through them. So you can see with this circuit here, a charge that goes through A doesn't go through B because it would just continue on once it's gone through A. Or one that goes through B doesn't go through A. So that's why we describe them as being in parallel. 
Now, where people often run into difficulty is what I'll look at in a second. But just to, again, illustrate what this looks like. Uh, so on the left, you've got filament bulbs in series. On the right, you've got them in parallel. And the way you notice parallel is by looking for these junctions or splits. So you can see here, current comes out of the positive side, it splits, goes through either bulb, and then the current recombines to go through the switch there. So we've got a split and we've got a recombination point. Those are characteristics of parallel components. Okay, so the one people get wrong is a diagram that looks like this. So in this circuit, any charge that goes through A cannot pass through B. So we describe A and B as in parallel, and most people are happy with that, that's fine. The difficulty is people then start to describe uh, relationships between A and C. So in this circuit, every charge is going to have to go through C, but only some of them are going to go through A. So we wouldn't describe A and C as being in either series or parallel. There's just no word to describe what those are. And it's the same thing with B and C as well. All the charges go through C, but only some of them go through B. So again, we wouldn't describe those as either series or parallel. We just don't try and describe that as a relationship. Okay, and then final point. Um, why might we decide to connect components in parallel rather than in series? So the main reason is it allows components to break and things to keep working. Because if, let's say in that diagram, A breaks, there's nothing to stop a current going through B and then through C. So it can keep working even though A is broken. And this is really common for light circuits. So most, most light systems, whether it be in your house or in this case, in Christmas tree lights, are connected to some degree in parallel so that if some of them break or one of them breaks, not all of them break. And that completes this video looking at circuit symbols, current, and then finally series and parallel.